Good afternoon. How is everyone? Thank you for joining us for the 11th and final lecture in our Issues and National Security Lecture Series. We greatly appreciate you turning out, especially considering how amazing the weather is. I had to uh, actually twist some arms from our lectures to not leave and go outside and actually show up to speak tonight. Um, but this is an important lecture. Um, this is a very relevant and meaningful way to end, I think, what's been a fantastic year for those of you who have made many of them um, been fascinating discussions throughout. I'd like to commend everyone who's attended on the really thoughtful questions you've asked our faculty. And we hope you've enjoyed attending these as much as I've enjoyed hosting along with a couple of my colleagues that helped host, but certainly all of the faculty thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to engage with you. And the questions you ask them make them better when they go back in the classroom to teach uh, our core students. So thank you for that. At the end of the afternoon slash early evening, what I'm gonna do is come up front rather than make everybody stay. I have a huge stack of certificates for those of you who got an email from me, you can come up and we'll formally present you, but we won't call you onto stage and, and do all the formalities. We'll just have you come up and grab those from me afterwards. Um, but thank you again very much for, uh, for taking part in these events. Tonight is a, uh, as I said, extremely meaningful and important discussion. We're gonna explore not only the consequences of conflict that are currently taking place around the world, we're also gonna look at natural disasters and maybe even dive a little bit into some of the, uh, the infectious disease pandemic discussions um, because we have two experts here from the Naval War College, um, two of my favorite people because they're on my team and I get to work with them every day and we have very diverse backgrounds so I think you're gonna be excited to engage with both of them and where they come from. First is Professor Brittany Card. Brittany's been with us for about 15 months now. Um, she came from the humanitarian sector. She's worked for a couple of different United Nations agencies. Um, both are a mouthful, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which you'll learn about tonight, as well as the World Food Program. And then I was very fortunate to meet Brittany about eight years ago when she worked at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which is widely recognized as one of the preeminent academic centers that engages directly with not only affected people around the world, but also humanitarian organizations that are caring for them. So Brittany will bring uh, very much a humanitarian perspective, although I will say that in the 15 months that we've gotten her here, she's become an outstanding military planner with respect to humanitarian operations. Um, to Brittany's right is Professor Tony Fox. Tony has been at the War College a long time. We've both been here for uh, well over a decade now. Um, Tony comes uh, initially from a legal background in the civilian world, so as you can imagine, he's very interested in international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict. Be careful with the questions you ask about those, because we could be here all night talking about legal stuff, just as a warning. Um, but Tony also served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Navy, and so he has an exceptional planning background as well on military operations and he has a deep understanding of how militaries support humanitarians around the world when required. So with no further ado, Brittany and Tony, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you all for coming, as Dave said. Today we're going to look at the kind of things that cause human suffering, human disasters, whether it be natural disasters, conflict. We're gonna look at the people and the organizations that go into those disaster areas and try to help people to alleviate suffering and to save lives. So hopefully by the time we're finished, you'll have an understanding both of the kind of threats that are out there, but also the people who respond and also how they do that. It's very uh, apropos that we are doing this particular lecture today because today is the 138th anniversary of the founding of the American Red Cross a group of people, as you know, who probably do a lot for people in the military service, but also respond to disasters not only in the United States, but around the world. Okay, so this is the last class. We had to make sure you had some kind of quiz before we let you go. You aren't getting the certificates unless you get this question right. Uh, who can tell me the answer to this? In that 30-year period, 
US military units that were doing their normal training, normal deployments, were diverted X number of times to conduct humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Who thinks it's 22? Show of hands. Anyone? No, no. takers on 22. OK, what am I bid for 65? Do I have any takers on 65? Okay. All right, Burns, you, we'll keep that. I'm wa watching you, Burns. OK, 83. Anybody want to go with 83? And which of you guys are really willing to put it out there and go with 366? All right. Oh, Guess what the right answer is? Those of you who guessed wrong, we're going to have remedial work after this lecture. Please report to Brittany and I. OK, next slide, please. <laughs> this shows you uh, oh, the uh, breakdown of the different, uh, let's call them diversions. Uh, and although there are only 22 combat missions there, recognize that some of these combat missions can last a long time. I can think of some that have lasted about 18 years. Next slide. OK, so today we're going to talk, as I discussed, about the different types of incidents that cause uh, humanitarian response and the people who respond and how they make that response effective. Next slide. So first, we'll talk about natural disasters. Here's a sampling of some that have happened in the past nine or 10 years. Earthquake in Haiti. Over 200,000 people killed. Earthquake and tsunami in Japan, 16,000 people killed. Note that the earthquake then caused a meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear reactor. Uh, so that was on top of the natural disaster event. Uh, how many of us remember Superstorm Stan Sandy? I can remember watching the waves roll in down at Second Beach. Uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan, at the time, it was the most powerful storm to ever hit land. The Ebola virus disease in 2014 in West Africa, and today we're seeing another outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Nepal, an earthquake with over 8,000 people killed in 2016. Hurricane Matthew hitting Haiti and the United States. And then, of course, who can forget the uh, 2017 succession of hurricanes that battered Houston, the Caribbean islands, Florida, and um, much of the East Coast? One thing that I want to just point out here, too, is we chose these examples for you because they all involved the use of militaries in the response, either the US military assisting our domestic or international militaries. And this is something we'll dive deeper into. So in this 10-year period, 265 million people were displaced. That means they had to leave their homes due to natural disasters. As you can see, weather-related incidents are by far the most numerous. Floods and storms are the most dangerous. And by comparison, things like volcanic eruptions, the kind of things movies are made about, are comparatively minor and not as big a threat, as long as you don't live right next to it. Um, a big part of this, as, as the years are going by, and as we think of things like that 2017 hurricane season, is climate change and how that's affecting all of this. Uh, right now, scientists are developing better technologies and methodologies to enable them to assess what weather events are actually influenced, perhaps caused, by climate change. And in 2017, they identified at least 15. And among those were the big uh, heat wave that swept across Europe in the summer of 2017. And these scientists estimate that those types of events, those heat waves, are now twice as likely to happen as they were in 1950. They also estimate that catastrophic floods are twice as likely to happen in Bangladesh and China as they were in 1950. Climate change is bringing a lot of this about. One of the biggest problems is the warming of the ocean and the rising of the seas. 
So for those of us who are operating on or near the oceans, this is a prime consideration and concern. So what Tony just described for us, the natural disaster side of the humanitarian landscape, it's met with the side of humanitarian response that is relating to armed conflict and other forms of violence. One trend we wanted to just show you, show you is that in the post-World War II period, we have seen the number of conflicts increase. 2017 was actually the most violent year on record since the end of the Cold War. And two, two trends stick out to us. It's that internal conflicts are more numerous and also the involvement of international forces in, external con in internal conflicts. This is very important, especially for humanitarians, because internationalized conflicts last longer, they are more violent, and they are much more difficult to solve. The majority of humanitarian need in the world is driven by conflict, and this is something that we cannot forget. One major result of this, of this phenomena is the movement of people. Tony told us how 265 million people have been displaced by natural disasters in the last 10 years. That is actually a number that often gets forgotten in the humanitarian context narrative. Often, we think of refugees and internally displaced people, people who have been forced to flee their home due to conflict, generalized situations of violence, or other forms of insecurity. We've provided some definitions here on the bottom for you because it's just important to realize that we are talking about two different types of populations. Refugees are those that have been forced to flee their home and they actually cross an international border. They leave their country and they seek refuge somewhere else and that is supposed to set into motion a series of international legal protections that have been developed since the end of World War II to help them. On the other hand, you have internally displaced populations. These are people, again, forced to flee their home but they remain within their own country's borders. Looking at the numbers, 1945, high about 50 million people displaced due to the conflict. We are now seeing an insurgence in these numbers since the mid-1990s. This is directly coupled with this trend in conflict that we looked at on the previous slide. If we look at this year, or last year, I guess, 2018, there were 68.5 million people who were forced to flee their home due to conflict. So this number is continuing to rise. We should know about next month what the latest figures are. When we look at this breakdown even further, something that gets left out of the narrative, about 25 million people of this group are refugees. That may not match the narrative that we hear in the news about the movement of refugee populations. However, 40 million people are displaced within their own borders. And that means it is on their own sovereign nation to provide resources for them to be able to return back home because we cannot forget that sovereignty is responsibility. A country must take care of its own populations. So humanitarians are trying to work within this context of protracted conflict, protracted displacement, because in reality, the average length of displacement is 26 years. That means generations live they die, they are born in situations of displacement, and the international community is trying to figure out how to work with states to make this so that way people can resettle into communities. Now look at this also within the context of urbanization. Okay? When people are displaced due to conflict or due to natural disasters, they often move towards cities because that is where they can access resources. But also most of the world, those of us who do not find ourselves in these extreme circumstances, we are also moving towards cities. It is estimated that by 2050, six billion people will live in cities. This means you have more people moving in an expansion of infrastructure, complex systems. No one actually knows what that means for humanitarian response. The future, the questions we need to ask ourselves are what does humanitarian response look like in an urban context? Because we do not know. What, even when we look at medium cities, large cities and mega cities, so about 1 million people to over 10 million people, I think this graph gives us a great idea of trends in where these cities are popping up. 
what I told you about warming seas and rising sea levels. Most of these cities you'll see are along coastal areas. Another driver for this urbanization is, again, climate change, because drought is killing agricultural fields, making it impossible to grow food. And many of the displaced farmers who now seek work go into cities in order to uh, find some new opportunity. One of the things to keep in mind when you look at this is Jakarta, the capital of, well, right now the capital of Indonesia, is subject to annual floods. And those floods have gotten so bad that the country of Indonesia is now going to move its capital out of Jakarta. OK. So take everything we have just talked about, already a daunting landscape, and now we start thinking about the spread of infectious disease. We have people moving for economic reasons, to flee violence, to survive natural disasters. We have urban centers growing. People are living more closely together. Our lives are more intertwined. I can travel to the other side of the world and be there in 12 hours. When we think about that in the context of pandemics and infectious disease, it poses great challenges for states, governments, militaries, humanitarian actors in how we would respond to an outbreak. And we were confronted by this in 2014, like Tony highlighted earlier, with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, where you had three nations in West Africa have thousands of people dead, millions of people displaced from their home because of this outbreak, and the US military actually responded as part of their response there. For the first time, a disease-driven foreign humanitarian assistance mission. And as Brittany mentioned about flight and jet travel, think too about how Ebola back then reached the United States and other countries. It was people traveling on planes who weren't even aware they were sick when they got on the plane, uh, but were carrying the disease with them. OK, so that's a little bit of what the landscape looks like. A little bleak. We don't want you to be too scared, because the world has actually organized itself very well to respond to these challenges. And that's what we're going to look at next. So we're going to think in the context of a natural disaster response. We have a tsunami hit Japan tomorrow. This is how the international system would respond. At the top, the primacy is the affected state. And that is because it is the role of the affected state to help its population and respond to a disaster within its own borders. Many states have built up very robust natural disaster management offices. And also, national militaries can be a first responder within their own borders. We have a colleague on our team from Chile. And the reason it is so beneficial to have him with us is that in Chile, the military is a first responder to natural disasters in their own country, something very different from us in the United States. The affected state often, the local population, community, national governments, they have the resources and the capabilities and the capacities to respond, help themselves recover, and build back. But sometimes, that is not enough. A natural disaster can overwhelm that national capacity and that is when you will have the international humanitarian sector called into action. In many countries around the world, the United Nations has built up a very robust humanitarian country team, close relationships with the national government, with different embassies. And when they are called into action, the UN can mobilize the international community, whether that be with other UN agencies, the Red Cross, which we'll talk about in a moment, or thousands of national governmental organizations that have sprung up to respond in this system. However, that still may not be enough. A disaster can be so bad that it overwhelms this side on the right. And that is when we see militaries plug in. Very often, once you have this mobilization, this call for international assistance, the humanitarian sector, will come, NGOs will start coming into a country, all at the request or acceptance of the national government, because they remain in charge. But then you will also have other states have bilateral ag agreements, say the United States and Japan. 
we would have our embassy coordinate with their national government. What is the proper role for the State Department, the US Agency for International Development, the Department of Defense, possibly? And that is where you will see this more robust system come into place. Could I just, does everybody know what we mean when we have this term up here, country team? That is the members of the embassy in that country. Uh, so the ambassador and all his staff, the consul, that sort of thing, defense attaches, all those people who work in the embassy comprise the country team. So we have this larger green circle up on the slide here just to highlight to you is that often you will have operation centers form in which foreign militaries can work in the same space as the national military. They probably have pre-existing strong relationships, practice, exercise trainings, but then they can mobilize and work together in these settings to provide humanitarian assistance. Now this is a very neat picture, right? Step by step gives us a good idea. In reality, the humanitarian system looks more like this. And I know you can't read it, that's part of the point. Uh, but on the right here, we have NGOs, we have the military, we have national governments, but we also need to think about the private sector, the public sector, donors, the media. Each of these actors fits into the ecosystem and they all work to provide us information, mobilize resources, provide funding. I mean, it's amazing how many people can come together to work within these settings to make things happen. And in the private sector, for instance, there is one in particular uh, international package delivery company that has a wealth of information on airports around the world that they provide to humanitarian responders who are going into a, a different country to uh, respond to an event like this. Also, you see up here the media, and the media can do a lot to drive the response. Uh, they can call attention to certain NGOs as opposed to others, which will affect the donations they get. Uh, they can be very critical of the government or other uh, parties that are intervening and can really shape the way a response occurs. Okay. So to now just touch on a couple different types of NGOs or intergovernmental organizations that often respond in these situations. At the top, we have this labeled as a special category. They're not really NGOs, they're not government. They have a special status in the humanitarian sector. On the left, we have the International Committee of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. The ICRC works to protect and provide resources to victims of armed conflict and violence. They work with states to make sure that they are respecting and acting according to international humanitarian law. They want states to fight warfare in a legal way in order to minimize civilian harm and civilian risk. On the right-hand side, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, that is made up of national societies. Every country in the world has one. We have the American Red Cross, whose birthday is today. And those national societies are very often made up of the affected community. And that is because the local community is a first responder. They will help their family, they will help their neighbor, and that's something that does often get overlooked and it needs to make sure that their voice has a seat at the table within this broader ecosystem, and that's what the IFRC works to ensure. In the middle row, we have the specialized United Nations agencies. Each one has a specific focus area and a mission. The name alone, I think, will give you a good indication. Starting on the left, we have the UN Refugee Agency, the International Organization for Migration, the World Health Organization, the World Food Program, and the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Each of these is a leader in its field. It develops technical standards, provides trainings, and it works with the NGOs in a response to make sure that all resources are brought to bear. This bottom category, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, some of these you may recognize. You may give money to them, you may volunteer for them, but these are professional organizations, each with a specific mission, and that mission will tell you what their focus area is. If you are out in the field and you meet someone who works for an NGO, ask them, what is your mission? And they should be able to tell you. If they can't, 
you know they're not very serious about their work. Another important thing to highlight is that NGOs greatly vary in size. They can be one person, they can be thousands of people, one dollar budget, billion dollar budget. I mean, there is immense power in networks behind these NGOs and they often work together to complement one another. Thinking about you know, when militaries plug in, each of these NGOs also has a very different relationship with the military. Some may want to work closely with them, like World Vision, they are not shy about that. And some may want to keep their distance, like Doctors Without Borders. And the reason for that, it's not arbitrary, it's because of the humanitarian principles. So the humanitarian principles were developed based on a book and an experience by a French businessman named Henry Dunant. And he was walking down the road and he saw a battle in 1859 and he could not believe the carnage. The battle had more casualties than Gettysburg. Wounded were being left on the battlefield, untreated. And so he went into the town and he mobilized local people to come out and help these people who had been left to die for no reason, wounds that could be treated. Based on this experience, he wrote a book called The Memory of Solferino, and that book really sparked a grassroots campaign. And it started a campaign saying, we need an organization that can fill these gaps. When militaries and states are fighting one another, we need to prevent unnecessary suffering and harm, and we need someone to help do that. And that is how the International Committee of the Red Cross was actually created, and how international humanitarian law was created. But fast forward us to the present day, and it has also given us the humanitarian principles. So starting from the top, humanity, kind of the basic principle of humanitarian action. It tells us that humanitarians will address human suffering wherever it is found. It's very important. It does not matter where people are located, where they're from, what their race is, their religion. But humanitarians really wanted to articulate this. And so they said, we will also be impartial. We will provide humanitarian assistance based on need not according to anything else. So thinking back to that battle of Solferino, it means that if I'm out on a battlefield, I'm not helping one side over another based on advancing a military objective or trying to advance along an end state. I will look at who needs my help wherever they are. In those two principles, they tell us what is good humanitarian action? The second two principles, neutrality and independence, they tell us how can we actually achieve good humanitarian action? Because it's much more difficult to put into practice. Neutrality says we as humanitarians, we will not take sides. Again, tying it back to we will use need as our metric and we will remain independent. We will be separate, autonomous from political, military, economic objectives. Now, one question we always get on the independence is a lot of NGOs receive their money from governments. So how can they do that and still be independent? The US is actually the largest donor in the world for NGOs and humanitarian funding despite some decreases in the last year. There are some NGOs get, that get 90% of their budget from the national government. And the reason that humanitarians can remain independent, even with this financial nature of its, uh, of its existence, is that they will do the same type of programming no matter where in the world, based on the money they get. They, the money cannot dictate what type of programming they deliver, they will use it to make their own decisions about what type of programming based on need, based on neutrality, and that is how it will be executed. Another thing that often comes up, and we've asked some of our students this, and they're in the room, so I won't call them out, but 
if we see these principles, then can, can military actors be humanitarians? If these are the principles by which humanitarian action, the professional, international, humanitarian sector governs itself and regulates itself, can militaries be humanitarians? In this calculus, they cannot. Independence alone. Because even when we have the US military assisting Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, natural disaster response, they may be on a humanitarian mission, they may be providing life-saving assistance to populations, but within the broader ecosystem of all the other people that they're interacting with, they can never be independent because the US military and the government will still tell them where to go and what to do. So with this very disparate and fragmented system working to govern itself and set frameworks, another answer that came up in the 1990s was, we do need some type of centralized body to help us because there are so many different actors in this space. And that is why the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs was created at the UN. Their primary mission is to coordinate. It is to build consensus and to facilitate, to be a broker. There is no command and control, another thing our military students have a hard time with. So they can't tell anyone what to do. But they work to advance policy, information sharing, mobilizing money, so that way everyone can get on the same page, pairing gaps in re available resources within a crisis. For our purposes, we're very interested in OCHA because civil military coordination is an inherent part of this mission. Okay. So thinking about what coordination looks like, it takes many different forms, but one way is the cluster system. And so OCHA sits at the middle, you have a natural disaster, everyone comes together, they're in a country, they're trying to figure out what to do, so we stand up the cluster system. And the cluster system has been a functional division of humanitarian response. Organizations realize that we need to work with partners who have similar missions and similar mandates. We all may not have the same capabilities and resources, but we can still work together to get our arrows moving in the same direction. And so looking around the wheel, just to give a few examples, it's everything from logistics to education to health to food security. In each of these sectors is led by a UN agency or an NGO. And they were kind of as the herder for these people uh, when they're in a cluster meeting together. We actually give you an example on the left here. This is in the Philippines. Everybody sitting together in a room, talking to each other, sharing their needs assessment. What do you have? What do you need? Trying to move this situation forward so that way they can get the response going. Just a paper map in the middle of the room with a bunch of sticky notes. I think we've all been there. So thinking back to this civ-mil coordination, it also can take many different forms, and it's very context-driven. So we've talked a lot about natural disaster response, and that would be more in the green zone on the left end, cooperation. It means in a relatively benign environment, you can have militaries, you can have humanitarians sit in the same room together, like in the Philippines, that picture we showed you on the previous slide, Canadian military sitting in the back, quietly, but listening. And it means that there's an environment where humanitarians and militaries can sit together and they know that each of their principles will not be negatively affected due to their physical proximity. However, the coexistence, the other opposite end, the red, that is unfortunately more of the reality. That is our Syria's Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Venezuela. Unfortunately, most humanitarian action takes place in a conflict setting. And in those cases, you cannot have militaries and humanitarians sit in the same room together because humanitarians, they want to protect those humanitarian principles because it's what keeps them alive. They do not have guns, they do not have security. 
It is people seeing them as independent and neutral. That's what keeps them alive. Two instance, instances of Ebola outbreaks. In 2014, Ebola breaks out in Sierra Leone, Liberia. The Doctors Without Borders contingent there that is starting to treat the uh, patients realizes they are being overwhelmed. Even though Doctors Without Borders almost never works with international military forces in a humanitarian response, they requested international militaries to come in and assist with the effort to stem that Ebola outbreak. So there you're really looking at cooperation. A few years later, we now have Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Unlike Liberia, unlike Sierra Leone, co there's conflict going on in, in DRC. Uh, it is not a ben benign environment. Aid workers are being attacked, even those who are trying to provide medical assistance to Ebola patients. So there you're going to see something more at this end of the spectrum, probably. And in those cases, the UN, OCHA, or another body can act as a go-between between the humanitarian and the military side. Because what people are increasingly coming to, to bear with is we may not want to sit in the same room, but it can be a matter of life or death, and we need to know where the other is operating and what they are doing. OK. Dave warned you that I was going to talk about international humanitarian law, and I'm going to give you the second quiz of the night. When the military of one country goes into another country without that country's consent, what do we call that? An invasion. Yes, that's the correct term. So the first time the US Navy tried to respond to a natural disaster in another country was in 1907. An earthquake and tsunami hit Kingston, Jamaica, destroyed about 80% of the buildings, killed about 1,000 people. Two US Navy battleships and a torpedo destroyer left Guantanamo Bay loaded with medical supplies and food and arrived a couple days later in Jamaica. The British governor general in Jamaica looked out his window, saw these warships, and said, what is going on? Nobody had asked him if they could arrive and help out. He said, thank you for your offer of assistance, but no thank you, please leave. So we've all learned our lesson. And now, international militaries will only assist in humanitarian responses when the affected nation makes the request. Next. The militaries can provide many services, but in the interest of making sure that the affected nation government is running the, the response, and the, a response is always going to be driven by and run by the affected nation, that National Disaster Management Agency or some other government agency that Brittany mentioned earlier. So international militaries that are responding they will typically provide indirect assistance. That is, they will provide assistance that's at least one step removed from the population of the affected nation. Now, this doesn't always happen, but this is the way it's supposed to work. So helicopters leave a US Navy ship bringing water and medical supplies. They go to a, uh, a base occupied by the affected nation's military or where their national defense, uh, disaster management agency is located. They turn over the medical supplies and water, and it's those people from the affected nation who then distribute it to the people who are in need. Actually giving the medical assistance, the supplies to the affected people is called direct assistance. We try not to do that in foreign countries. However, we might sometimes provide infrastructure support. And that is something where the military can really come in and provide, usually in a very quick response, capabilities that might not be present or might not be present for some time in the affected nation. So things like getting airfields up and running again after an earthquake, getting a seaport up and running again after an earthquake or tsunami. Um, 
providing weather information, setting up communications networks, uh, opening up roads, clearing and repairing bridges, that sort of thing. Next slide. I just want to add that the infrastructure support, it confronts the principle of last resort, which is something that's often thrown around in the humanitarian community, that military should only be brought in as a last resort. Well, the learning, and from our own experience, is that actually we need to appreciate the unique capabilities that militaries can provide that are essential in the first 24 to 72 hours. That's a first priority. That is what can help the civilian response really get up and running to its maximum capacity once they're mobilized. And Tony's going to talk about some specifics in a few more slides. Well, but that's also when you're most likely to see that international military providing the direct support. The US Navy helicopter landing outside a village that's been affected by a typhoon, and medical supplies and water being hand and food being handed out to the people in that village, that sort of thing right after uh, the disaster happened and there's nobody else able to respond. So what are the kind of things that the militaries can do? Um, Brittany gave you a very good explanation of the cluster system and the kind of things different clusters address, the, the different issues, such as food, security protection, health care. Uh, these are the kind of things that militaries can often bring in such a response as well. So you see that there is an awful lot of overlap between what the military can provide and what the NGOs and international organizations can do. I would say that the US military tends to stay away from something like this, tends to stay away from protection other than protection of their own people uh, and our own uh, equipment. You have actually had the Philippines reorganize its entire national disaster structure and agency according to the cluster system. So that way when the international humanitarian community comes, they can just plug right in and overlay. And so now the question is, how do we have militaries fit into this as well? So <clears throat> navies are especially suited to respond to international disasters because not only the US Navy, but other navies are often forward deployed. They have ships out all over the world that are able to respond quickly. Um, here you see a US Navy uh, amphibious uh, ship alongside a very wonderful Chilean amphibious ship. Um, and two U US uh, Marine Corps v uh, MV-22 Ospreys, which are aircraft with uh, engines that tilt like this so they can take off and land like a helicopter or fly like an airplane. Uh, those are wonderful in responding to a disaster because they can carry a lot of stuff, they can go pretty far, and they can go pretty fast compared to a regular helicopter. Next slide. And there you see a wonderful MV-22 Osprey operated by the US Marines in the Philippines during uh, the response to Typhoon Haiyan. And you see here a US Marine officer and a Philippine uh, soldier bringing aid uh, packages out of that uh, aircraft and over to the Philippine uh, military or Philippine disaster management agency personnel for it to be distributed then to needy Filipino people. Brittany and I uh, work for the War College's Civil Military Humanitarian Response Program that was started late in 2015. The director is none other than the illustrious David Pilati, who you uh, saw earlier tonight. Uh, we also have on our staff Dr. Hank Brightman, who is sitting over there, uh, as well as uh, Ben Davies, who couldn't be here tonight, and our Chilean C Naval Commander Sergio Gomez, who is enjoying 90-some degrees in Florida right now with his family. Um, but this is what we do. And these are some of the people we work with on a regular basis. Uh, so you, as you can see, we work with a lot of different schools, uh, NGOs, other organizations, both international and US organizations, um, all in an effort to try and make sure that the US military and all militaries can do a better job of coordinating the response to uh, natural disasters and work better alongside NGOs in conflict zones 
such as Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan right now. Just want to say that you know the material that we showed you today, this is material that we have shown to students here at the Naval War College, to leading universities, and also we recently went to Guam and worked with Pacific Partnership mission staff getting ready to go out on one of their, um, one of their deployments. And so I think that for us, it shows that this material, it not only helps humanitarians understand militaries, but it also helps militaries understand humanitarians. And that's because humanitarian response and civil military coordination, it really comes down to relationships. And so we want to not only be a resource for you all and for the Naval War College about how to get in touch with the different actors who are involved in this ecosystem, who are likely to respond, because we would really like to build up the relationships now, so that way when we get in country somewhere, we all know each other and it makes it easier to work together. So. Thank you all very much. Thank and you. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Yeah. One of your earlier slides, um, there was a graph about displaced folks. There was a legend with four different categories. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yes. Here, I'm give it it was about one. conflict. Oh, okay. Just a, the leg. Mike? Sorry. It's a legend. It was I have one. a legend question. This, this one. Could you describe this for? Sure. Um, so this is from PRIO. This is from their conflict mapping database. So interstate would be between two states. Intrastate is what they call internal conflict. Internationalized, they classify that as a country is involved in a way that they have troops directly involved in country. So what's that distinction between so, intra so Syria is a great example of an internationalized internal or, or intrastate conflict. In other words, in Syria, you basically have a civil war going on, and Russia has intervened. We now have uh, US forces in, in the country, uh, and others as well, all taking part in this, uh, what is legally still defined as an internal, uh, essentially, civil war. Yeah, so this, this graph has a very specific right, meaning that a state has troops, but internationalized can also mean, unfortunately, proxy support. So right now, people are very concerned about Yemen becoming more internationalized with backings of Iran to the Houthi rebels. So you can have that take different types of manifestations, but for this graph, that is specifically what they mean. And by the numbers and by that definition, then the US actually has, is involved in the most internationalized conflicts in the world, they count seven. Um, so Iraq, Afghanistan, Mali, Syria, et cetera. Yeah. Any other questions? Let me run this over to you. Thank you for the presentation. It helps us understand a lot more of how it all works. Um, as military families, obviously we're moving all the time. And I noticed that there's more natural disasters, more storms, more flooding, more of a lot. So we're going into an area, and it, when we get there, it might actually start to flood or start anything. So what's the best way that us, the families, not necessarily active duty, but us, the families, the spouses, can plug in to help? What's the best way? What's the most, you know, this is... Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think one that really gets to the fact that local communities are first responders. And so I think we're very fortunate here in the US. If you're moving somewhere, you know, you can reach out to your municipal or state emergency management agency. So thinking about the Rhode Island example, uh, Pima, the Providence Emergency Management Agency, they actually have communities, some of our coworkers are in it, you can volunteer, get access to trainings, resources, or become a volunteer to mobilize when a disaster happens to help your own community. The Red Cross, um, and I think there are a lot of international variants of that um, in terms of the humanitarian sector where you can either volunteer or gain access to resources. But you are right that flooding and storms, especially in the US, the Midwest, big cause for concern where there are very large military installations and something we're grappling with right now. Thank you. Yeah. 
And the number one thing they say is give cash yeah. to, to organizations that you look up and figure out that they spend the money in a meaningful way with very little overhead. Yeah, have most to, of the time they don't want donations of clothes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but money is very helpful, as you might imagine. In situations like the tsunami and earthquake in Japan, when you have a lot of military, um, U.S. military families there, do you have to wait for permission to go in and rescue those families, or is it assumed that because we're already there, we have the right to go in and help them? Well, in a case like that, first of all, it depends on what the status of forces agreement says, but the particulars in a case like that are generally going to be, we already have forces there, we have the right to take care of, uh, of our dependents who are right, right there in the country. Uh, so that's generally what will happen. Just like uh, in the case of like a non-combatant evacuation operation where like a, typically an embassy is threatened or something, uh, that's one of the instances, call it a mini invasion, where uh, military forces will go in to extract uh, those embassy members uh, with or without the permission of the host nation. See, I've been working in some of these legal terms. I... Well, my question, th first of all, thanks a lot for the lecture. It was very interesting. Um, me and my family am, might be moving to a high risk area, and it will be the naval base. So is there a practice that you mentioned about the training um, on the naval bases outside of the US that I can oh. take, for example? Uh, because my wife, she's a civilian DOD, so I don't know how we are going to be involved into the whole Navy base, and I'm Ukrainian, so I don't know. Like, is there anything you know that on the naval bases outside overseas? A lot of times there's actually some Red Cross representatives on the base, even overseas, and they might be a good source for giving you that kind of information. Also, the command of, of the base should have disaster response plans in place, and they should have people you can talk to to get answers to that question. Uh, if you were going to get stationed at Norfolk, uh, Virginia, my first advice would be make sure you know how to swim. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question. You had the chart. It had these little hot spot looking. Yes. It had the world yeah. map. Yeah. There. And I was just curious because, oh, yes, exactly, this one. When we listened to the talk on feral cities, and he talked about how India, because I had asked my husband, where is India? And he said it's covered by all the circles. So is that something that you're kind of keeping an eye on? Like what types of new things do you imagine will be something that we need to respond to in a humanitarian nature? Specifically thinking of India? Or Yes, I would say that is right now that's really the cause for concern in terms of urbanization, especially because urban centers are not only becoming more interconnected by roadways and other routes, but urban sprawl, where does a city begin and where does it end? becomes very difficult to answer, especially in the case of India, right, when we look at this map. Uh, and so when we think about the context of humanitarian response, we know that natural ranging from natural disaster to a conflict setting, the impact is going to be much more severe, more people affected, at difficulty accessing basic services, moving around. And so it's really how can we get ahead of some of these trends that we know we can't stop but we can have plans in place and really work to understand when all of these factors converge, climate change, conflict, urbanization, what does that mean for us? And people are really trying to wrangle that right now. So one of the problems with this rapid urbanization is the resilience of the cities and how well they're constructed to withstand those kind of disasters. So in Chile, for instance, uh, there have been huge hugely powerful earthquakes that have not caused lots of casualties, have not destroyed a lot of buildings, because in Chile, the cities are built 
to withstand those types of shocks. A much uh, less powerful uh, earthquake was the one that hit Haiti and uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people because they weren't as well prepared. And so in countries where uh, people are aggregating quickly, you might not necessarily have uh, the best building standards when people are coming in rapidly. Uh, those are the areas where you really see a threat. In your opinion, is the US military better equipped and better at responding domestically in a DOMS mission, such as a, a Sandy or something like that, or internationally in many of the areas you've, you've described? Well, as I'm sure you know, uh, in response to Sandy, for instance, the first uniform wearing people to respond are the state national guards in the states that have been affected. So they are generally one of the first lines of defense against natural disasters within the United States. Uh, and it's only relatively rarely that we get called in as active duty members. Um, Katrina is an example. Some of the hurricanes in 2017 are another example. Um, but as you saw with one of the initial quiz we gave at the start, uh, our active component people who are deployed uh, are often being called on uh, to do these responses. And I really didn't mention the Air Force because I don't like the Air Force especially, except when I need a ride. But, um, you know, even in CONUS, uh, C-17s, you know, large aircraft can be providing intertheater lift in order to get, you know, huge amounts of supplies, say, from CONUS out to uh, the Philippines or, or anywhere else, really, globally. So, I would say for, for the active component, I would think it's the uh, international response. Uh, I don't know if Dave or Brittany have a different view, or Hank. The, the question came from a ringer, because this is Ryan from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I saw the Agency. shirt, yes. Yeah. So he, I'd, I'd actually like to hear what he thinks based on what you've seen in your, in your career. And then I'll give you my opinion. Obviously, I've, I've mostly only observed the military do domestic work, so that's why I'm most interested in comparing and contrasting what I've seen domestically and what we see internationally. And generally, I'm thinking more Title 10 forces as opposed to State National Guard Title right. 32 forces when I ask this question. For me, it's it, uh, they're a great partner, tremendous resource. Uh, obviously, I know you had made the comment that, you know, that perhaps integrating military earlier overseas is great. For us, I mean, it's 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 government doctrine, you guys are the last call. Uh, so we have an op, uh, uh, kind of a different view on how we look at that. The approval process to go up to the Secretary of Defense can take an insanely long amount of time. And then the cost factor, you know, $6,500 an hour for a Blackhawk, millions of dollars an hour for, or millions of dollars a day for a, uh, you know, a offshore military platform becomes a, a, a significant factor. So I appreciate being able to see how tremendous a response capability the military has internationally. And it's very interesting for me to be able to compare that to what I can see domestically. Both incredibly diverse and, and capable assets used in very different mission sets. Yeah. Uh, that's a great answer. And then I would ask everyone to look at that map again. And if you look at the Asia Pacific region and what we call the Ring of Fire, the US military trains much more that the forward deployed forces that operate in the Asia Pacific region tend to train much more for the international disaster response piece. So tend to be much better at it. In particular, the US Marine Corps is um, incredibly well prepared third Marine Expeditionary Force out of Okinawa. And what we have seen is in recent years, uh, more of a trend of the US military preparing for domestic response because of Katrina, because of Sandy. But, uh, but generally speaking, we spend much more time thinking about the international response piece because we have the National Guard who will respond in the states. Brittany, any other thoughts on that? I think the only other thing I'll add, which we didn't really touch on, is time that you brought up. So when we are talking about international militaries, especially our own military, becoming involved in international humanitarian response, it is for a short period of time. You have community organizations, the UN, humanitarian NGOs, they will be in a country for months to years. They are there for the long term. 
When we're talking about a military, it is two weeks to 30 days, because like you said, it's expensive, it, they have other things to do, it's not their primary mission, but they can bring a great deal of support and unique capability in an acute time period that can really help that civilian recovery go far. So those different factors really come into play. In the response to uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, which really devastated the central Philippines, uh, the bulk of the US military presence was only there about 30 days. As the old park ranger in here who used to do um, environmental response for Department of the Interior as regional environmental officer, it really depends on the kind of emergency you're talking about, too. If, if you're talking about something like an oil spill response, um, there's actually a role for the private sector, there's a role for the states to aggressively and get, get involved right off the bat, as opposed to doing what we call federalizing an event like that. Because as you heard from our expert from FEMA, as soon as you do that, the costs become astronomical. So the more you can contain that with local resources that are familiar with that particular issue, problem set, and have the resources in place to address it, the better off everyone is in the end. So, Hank, isn't that why states have emergency liaison officers from the military? Any other questions? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Brittany Thank you and Tony. All very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll uh, we'll end here with with just a few admin remarks. Um, first of all, everyone turn around to the back and please thank. We've had wonderful support from the Fleet and Family Service Center on base, um, who talk about taking care of our military personnel and their families. That's the organization that does it here in Newport, and they're our partner in this lecture series. We simply couldn't do it without you. Thank you and everyone that came this year. Um, we look forward to partnering again with you next year if you'd be kind enough to do it with us. Thank you. Um, everyone turn around and wave to Aaron in the back booth from IRD. Um, our audiovisual team, her and Dean, gave us the support so we could do this this year. We kept both of them late at least one night every other week, so thank you. And then a round of applause for for everyone in the room for coming and everyone that came this year. Um, can't thank you enough on behalf of Admiral Jeff Harley. Thanks for coming to the Issues of National Security Lecture Series. Um, if you have any feedback whatsoever for next year, I've already had a request for uh, a cyber lecture, information warfare type of discussion. Um, please feel free to, to shoot me an email. I know everyone's got my email, David Pilati. And um, we'll take that into account, and we'll let the president of the War College ultimately decide on the lineup. But good luck to everyone. Enjoy the beginning of summer. And if you got an email from me and qualified for a certificate, if you meet me up front, I will be glad to present that to you. Thanks so much, and congratulations. <laughs>